Now I've come all the way from the Giants Causeway, so not as far as everyone else, but I'm really pleased to be here because my next book is going to be published by Science Press and illustrated by Marini Carrington. And yesterday was the first time I actually met Marina, so it's lovely to be involved in this event and to have met all the other authors as well. So, um, whilst I do live in Northern Ireland, you can probably tell from that, and I'm not actually originally from Northern Ireland, but I fell for a farmer, and that is that. <laughs> and actually, the falling for the farmer bit uh, was serendipitous, because that's when I started to write. Up until that point, I have always been a storyteller, so I'm a performing storyteller, I've been telling stories. I had my first live performance in Europe in 1986, when I was on tour, so I took myself on tour with my, <laughs> sounds ridiculous, I'm even blushing, <laughs> using the words on tour, with my guitar on my back, and I, those were the days when you could interrail. So you got a cheap ticket to travel around, and I thought I'd make a bit of extra money by singing. And it really didn't go very well. Uh, I used to go into pubs and say I was you know, English, and I could sing English folk songs. Would they be interested? No, thank you. I thought, this is, what am I going to do? You know, I had dark uh, auburn hair at the time. And I thought, well, you could really be Irish. So then I started to say I was an Irish folk singer. That's doing Irish songs, and boom! <laughs> <laughs> I made it! <laughs> <laughs> I think my grandparents are actually from Monaghan. So I, I do have some kind of link, but it was a bit tenuous. And as I started to travel around, uh, I really got into it. And I started to tell the story, so folk songs tell the story of how they got their song. And eventually the stories were more popular than my singing. So I started to tell stories, and I continued to do that, telling stories for about over 35 years. I never once, never once thought about writing them down. I've moved all over the place. I've lived in 30 different places, and um, about 10 years ago, 2009, I went on a blind date. I often do lots of rash things. It wasn't any old blind date. I was living in Scotland, and I, I have to admit it was on my bed. And I put, I want to meet someone within a hundred mile radius of Glasgow. And I, of course I didn't realise that Northern Ireland came within a hundred mile radius. And this is the way to me. And I thought, well, I'm not. So uh, we phoned and he said, I'll meet you at Derry Airport. And just make sure I can recognise you. I said, you'll know me. So I got off the airplane in a Viking helmet. Oh, no. <laughs> Jesus sandals and knee end socks, and the rest is history. And I travelled to and from Scotland and at one point had to make a decision because I had a son who was going to secondary school, so I would actually have to move here or just have to have a very long distance relationship. So I moved over here only to find that culturally it was a very different place and all the things that I used to do which were easy which involved adventuring. So I'm a theatre maker, I am a writer, um, and I also adventure, so I go up and down mountains and ski very cold places and all that kind of thing. And I just couldn't do it. Plus I had a son to carry around because we were living in a rural area. So I, in 2014, on December 31st, I decided I would take a year to do a year of adventure. So I tried to prove to myself that you did not even have to leave your kitchen to lead an adventurous life. So I set up a project called 365 Days of Adventure. I didn't know what would come out of that adventure. All I knew was I wanted to feel the aliveness that comes with taking risks and doing new things, not knowing whether you're going to be successful or not. And that's a big, I suppose, parallel with writing. You don't know whether you're going to be successful or not. So really, you have to invest in the process itself. That's the thing that has to bring you the greatest joy. So I didn't know where to start, so I started with obvious places, like eating sprouts. <laughs> and uh, th so you, if you're interested at all, because that's obviously a dangerous sport for me, eating sprouts, <laughs> um, I kept a video blog, 365 videos are on YouTube, all the things I did. So I ate sprouts, 
I've formed a memory sheet. I memorised the periodic table, which has never been useful to me except for at dinner parties after a certain time. <laughs> <laughs> I learnt foreign languages, I learnt to play chess, I did all sorts of things. And eventually the field that was this big started to narrow itself down. I, I really got a feeling of being on track. And what I did is I went into Tesco and went to the bottom shelf in the book section and got myself a Mills and Boone book. I also, it's called Harlequin Press these days. Mm. And I thought, well, I've never read a Mills and Boone book. I've never read any of those fiction. It's just not my thing, I don't think. But that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have an adventure and I'm going to read uh, some romantic fiction. It was medical romance. And I thought, gosh, by the way, these shouldn't be on the bottom shelf. Mm -hmm. I thought all the old ladies who had them in their trolleys, I was thinking, whoa, no wonder their trolleys packed high with lots of food. I thought, look, how hard can this be? Just how hard can it be to write romance and fiction? So I set about writing a book, which actually hadn't been published, and there's good reason why. Because every time I introduced a man to the story, I had this instinct just to kill him off. <laughs> It was pretty regular, you know, it was random, a big wave came, and knocked him out the boat, and I thought, oh, well, I think he's dead. <laughs> By the time I got to the end of the third chapter, it was great. It was in Pakistan, it was in a mudslide, and it was a terribly slow death. <laughs> anyway, after three chapters, I thought, do you know what, it is much harder than it looks. <laughs> I don't think I'm for romantic fiction, <laughs> but for grisly, gruesome death. <laughs> so I put that to one side and then decided to have a tree identification adventure. I'd learn from the shape of a tree and its leaves what it was. I was talking to my husband, who's a, a farmer, telling him about hawthorn trees. Now, all the law, the folklore associated with hawthorn trees, and if you don't know about hawthorn trees, you should, because no hawthorn trees are associated with fairies. He said, Well, we've got one of those on the farm. So, So I went on YouTube and I watched this video about how to see a fairy and I thought, right, that's it, we're off. We got in the back of the van and we went on a fairy hunting trip. We parked a respectful distance from this tree, also called a fairy thorn, and I had smudge sticks because everyone said you've got to protect yourself because like, you're going to get attacked by fairies. So put smudge sticks around the van. And the best time to see a fairy, if you don't know, you should, it's at twilight, the moment of time of the day. So just when it's getting dark, just when the fairies come out. So it was July, so uh, it was about 20 past 10, half past 10 was twilight. So I went down to the fairy thorn and I offered what you should. Did I see a fairy? No, I did not see a fairy. I thought, don't worry, don't worry, because you've got another chance of doing one. So I got up at about four o'clock in the morning, went down to Fairy Thorn, and you can actually see this in the evening as well. Um, the mist was rolling in, the sky was a kind of purple, and the tree was like super duper. It was like it had been imprinted onto this purple background. And to be honest, if you watch the video, you can hear a little bit of fear in my voice, because on one hand, I thought, I don't want people to think I actually believe in fairies. But on the other hand, I was thinking, I totally believe in fairies. There's no so I'm waiting and I did not see a fairy. So I went back to bed and when I woke up, two things happened. One, my favourite hat had disappeared. And two, there was a story about that tree fully formed in my head. So I went home and in seven days I wrote that story down. And in order to complete it, I had to learn every inch of the farm and the surrounding area, which all featured in that story. One of the things that that project Feeling the Fifth and Love Daily Adventure did for me was connect to me to local people. It connected me to the land and to my husband's heritage and to the people and to the language. So some of um, what I write in the Irish tradition and some of what I write in the Ulster Scots tradition and I fused the two together. And so I wrote that story and I didn't think anything of it. 
it. I didn't consider myself to be a writer. And I wrote it as I speak, so in the oral tradition. So as I want to direct address the reader, I thought, well, I'll tell you what, for an event, I'll send it off to a publisher. Just, you know, have a crack. <laughs> so I sent it off. I didn't expect to hear anything at all. And I got a book called Writers and Artists Yearbook, which if you're a writer, you probably know that book. It's got all the editions of it. And I went alphabetically, so I went to the first publisher in Northern Ireland um, at the beginning of the book, which is Black Flag with Blue. So I sent it off. Just, I thought that would be just what yeah, nothing was going to happen. Anyway, six weeks later, I get an email saying, that's, that's a great story. Can you send us the rest of the book? <laughs> no, there's no rest of the book. <laughs> so I go back so there isn't actually a rest of the book. Uh, Think about, you know, maybe someone looking for Lee Stanley and maybe like CD or something like that. So you know, I'm going to have to write another story. I thought, well, how am I going to do this? Because that first story appeared by magic, all the different the fairies. And my husband said, well, you're just going to have to get the different fairies. I said, well, I don't know where to go. I said, you know, I feel like I've done it only easy too. <laughs> so he took me then to a place called Murmuth Bay. So there's a Murmuth Bay in County Down. There's also a Murmuth Bay up in the county entry. And uh, it absolutely incredible wild place. You can see over to Scotland, and immediately I can see over to Scotland there's a kind of ache in me. So all the stories I write are actual true stories. They're my personal stories, covered in local folklore, and then a spin of my own story around that. So I wrote a second story, and I got a publishing contract, and then had to write the rest of the book. As a result of writing that book, I suppose I suddenly felt very rooted here in a way I've never felt rooted anywhere. I've always had itchy feet, I've always wanted to move on, I've never really completely felt at home. But because I had to listen to the land and respect people's culture, so when I was researching the second story, the Mero of Mermuch Bay, so Mero is the Irish or Anglo Irish version of a merman or a mermaid, there's a local legend about clay, healing clay, which the McCormicks, and only a McCormick can lift this clay. And so I had to make sure when I was using people's names, their families still exist because people don't move around very much, that those are always the good people. <laughs> those are always the good people. And when you make people, no matter whether they're good or bad, good, then they become lovely people. So I've had, from that book, a life, and I don't mean a writer's life or an author's life, or fame or fortune, which you never get as a writer anyway. I've had a life. And so there's a part of me then, as a result of that experience, decided, well, you know, I'm here for good. And if I am here for good, what other stories are there? So I then, um, there was a little bit more magic to that story. So that, my book, The Fairy Fawn Love Story, um, one of the places you can get it is in the visitor centre of the Giant Causeway. And two years ago, Toronto Press had the trip with it here. Mm -hmm. it here. And part of it was uh, a tour to the North Coast. And one of the editor, Monique Mulligan, bought my book. And she read it on the plane on the way home, and the fairies must have been smuggled in fussing back any problem whatsoever. <laughs> because I had a note from Monique saying, Oh, you know, we'd really like you to write a collection for us. And I thought, those fairies are absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I went back to the tree and I gave them some more whiskey and cream, which is true, disappeared. Now, I don't know if my husband took it. I like to believe they are actually, you know, still blissed out on it. And um, they're very much of his still working. So if you were to ask me do I believe in fairies, I definitely believe in something. And I definitely believe in the land. And there's something very magical about this place. And maybe as an outsider, I see that magic or experience that magic differently. But I think uh, as an outsider, or as what's called as a blow-in, uh, in my, where I live, and it will be maybe 500 years before my children's 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 children actually become locals. Mm -hmm. The stories that grew out of the land have become my story and have kept me connected to this place in a way that I feel comfortable. Somebody said to me, you know where you belong, where
if someone asks you, where do you want your bones to lie when you're gone, I would be happy for them to lie here. <coughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to, uh, so we've got a new collection coming out in July next year with Serenity, and Marina um, will be illustrating it. And those are also stories all based in the North Coast as well, or places that have been important in my journey. So um, my husband's a farmer, traditional farmers are not spending any money whatsoever. So um, when we went on our honeymoon, we went in the back of his van, we bought a mattress in the back of his van, and we went to Donegal, and it's like lashing down with rain, got absolutely wet, and then we came home. We had one, a one night honeymoon, but out of that one night honeymoon, this story came, this story is set in Donegal. I, so I wrote a show um, called The Wonder Tales, which toured Northern Ireland, and you might have seen the fairy form. The fairy form was adapted for stage at the marketplace. In, it was in Armagh, and it was in it. I think it was in Enniskillen as well. Um, so I wrote a new show, and so I always speak my stories first, and then I write them down. So this story, I'll just do a little, a tiny little bit from it, is in the next book. And this one is called The Selkie Bride. There was once a young man who lived in Carrick Finn in Donegal, and his name was Mahesha. And I'm telling you the truth when I say there was no man set named than he. For Mahesha is the old Irish way of saying seven. Mahesha means six plus one. And on the day Mahesha came into the world, he joined six older brothers, the youngest of whom was already a full seven years old on the day Mahesha was born. And his seventhness was not confined to his relationship with his brothers. No, Mahesha was the seventh son of the seventh son, and Mahesha's father's father was also the seventh son of the seventh son himself. But in spite of his seventhness, the power of the cure he did not have. Nor was he in possession of the second sight, nor did he have a ferocious appetite for battle like the mighty Kuhanan, the greatest sailor of all time. It seemed like Mahesha was cut from a cloth more ordinary, although it does have to be said that he did have an uncommon gentleness about him and an unusual preference for the company of the sea over the company of when Mahesha was seven years old, he could take his own curry out onto the water by the power of his own oar and spend the whole day fishing, listening to the lapping of the waves against the side of his boat, watching the sparkle of the sun on the surface of the water, and following the birds who knew where to make the best catch. By the time he was 14, Mahesha was the best fisherman in the Carrick Fish. People used to say that when he took his boat out, the lobsters would fair run into his creels before he lifted them. They said the glashans would leap into his boat of their own accord. And they used to say that shoals of mackerel would dig through the water around his boat and call in clam and char alike, even when the char was way up north in icy waters. On Mahesha's 17th birthday, on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year, Mahesha rose early when the moon was still high in the clear night sky. The weather was set for a perfect day's fishing and he was keen to get out onto the water. He made his way through the marrow of dune, through sedge, through spurge and through sea holly. And as he approached the cove at Carrick Finn, he heard a strange singing. It was the kind of singing that could break your heart wide open and brimful it with all manner of sweetness. He slowed his step, he hushed his breathing as best he could, and when he got to the ridge that looked down onto the strand, there before him he saw seven uncommon beautiful He hid himself behind a clump of marrow grass and he watched them dance and he listened to them sing. And how
how they did magic him with a haunt in their voices. And how they did magic him with a look of their bodies. Each had long, straight hair, hue and shine of a chestnut straight out of its casing. Each had big brown eyes, not a drop of brownness in them. And each had skin that shone as silver and as bright as the North Star. Mahesha looked all about the strand, and he saw how seal skins were hidden behind rocks, and when he saw those skins, he knew that these women were no ordinary women. He knew that these women were seal women. He knew that these women were selkies, and he knew that if he took one of those skins, the owner of that skin would have to stay with him. She'd have to leave the sea. She'd have to marry him. She'd have to live with him, like it or no. He crept down onto the strand and he took one of those skins and returned to his clump of brown grass. And when the first streaks of dawn reddened the sky, the selkies went behind the rocks and took their skins and pulled them on and dived back into the sea, all except one. He couldn't find her skin because Mahesha had it. The selkie started to cry and if you heard that cry with your own ears, you would have taken it for the saddest song that ever Got some. <laughs> Mahesha could not bear the hurt of it and he felt ashamed for having taken her skin. He ran down onto the beach. He held out her skin for her to take and he said, I am sorry for having taken your skin. I will not steal you from the sea. You would make me the finest wife I could wish for. But take this skin, you must go home. The selkie softed a smile at Mahesha. And this is what she said to him. She said, because your heart is righteous and because there is nothing but gentleness in you, I will go with you and I will be your and that is exactly what she did. She went with him, she became his wife, and a great love grew between them, as wild and as beautiful as the orchids that grow in the hollows between the sand dune ridges. And in spite of the fact her skin was not locked away, she never ran away or tried. She never left. And Mahesha never locked that skin away, in spite of his brother's warnings. Didn't that brilliant from Bombay have a selkie wife? And didn't his selkie wife find the key to the box he'd hidden her skin in? Didn't she take that key and didn't she open that box and didn't she pull that skin on and didn't she run away to the sea and never come back? That's what Mahesha's brother said to him, but Mahesha said, I want a wife who wants to stay with me, not one that has to stay with me. If my wife wants to run away back to the sea, then so be it. And so Mahesha hung that selkie skin next to his own shirt, and there it stayed. And although she held that skin from time to time to remember her cell phone, she never took it, and she never ran away. Well, she didn't for the first year, anyway. And that's... <laughs> 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 Thank you.